Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Baptist Church this Sunday morning. Thank you for joining us, wherever you're joining us from. Last Sunday, we lit the candle of love. We light it and the candle of hope again as we remember that Jesus, born in Bethlehem, will come again to fulfill all of God's promises and bring us everlasting peace and joy. Today we light the third candle of Advent, the candle of joy. In Matthew 2, 10 and 11, we read, When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Just as the birth of Jesus gave great joy to his mother, so his presence in the world gave great joy to those who had none before. He healed them and gave them hope and peace when they believed in him. We light the candle of joy to remind us that when Jesus is born in us, we have joy, and that through him there will be everlasting joy on earth. Joy is like a light shining in a dark place. As we look at this candle, we celebrate the joy we find in Jesus Christ. This morning we have the same announcement we've had for the last several Sundays, um, that we have no announcements. Um, but we are going to remind you of offering, that you can uh, e-transfer your offering um, to, through the church's website. You can also mail your offering to Calvary Baptist Church at Box 115 uh, here in Clarney. Uh, if you need more information, it's on the church website. So let's go to prayer now just to uh, thank God for for being God. Let's pray. Right now, Father, we want to thank you for your presence here with us wherever we are. Um, we certainly are going through some challenging times, but the one constant is you, and we thank you for that. God, as we, uh, we think about our offering right now, we know that even though it's challenging right now, you are still blessing us. There are so many that have a lot less than what we have. You have uh, certainly blessed us in many, many, many ways. And God, right now, we want to give a little bit of that back to you, um, whether it's our time, our talents, or, or our money. Um, God, we pray that you would take it and bless it and use it to, to show people who you are, um, especially at this Christmas season that we, uh, we're coming into. And God, right now, as we're going into our service, we pray that you would just... Uh, Help us to keep our focus on who you are, not just the babe in the manger, but the babe in the manger that became the man on the cross, that became the one who rose from the dead. And uh, this, is, this is one story. This is not three stories. And God, we pray that you would help us to be mindful of that as, uh, as we go through our, our service here this morning. Pray that you'd, you would bless the Wiesners as they lead us in, in music here this morning, and we also pray for Pastor as he opens his mouth to speak what you put on his, on his heart. And we pray that we would hear your spirit speaking very clearly through the words he uses. We thank you again for your presence with us wherever we're located here today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to say thank you so much, Al, <clears throat> for opening us, open our services this morning. Um, you know, I, I've been thinking for the last couple of days about the difficulties of what we're going through right now. And, and it's, it's tempting, isn't it, for all of us to just kind of get under the circumstances. But can I just say this? We're not being persecuted. This is not persecution. There are brethren being persecuted as we speak, as we share together. There are brothers and sisters around who, um, who are facing a very different circumstance than COVID. They are being persecuted for knowing Jesus. <clears throat> Having said that, um, it is a difficult time for us. We don't want to minimize it, most certainly. But we need to put it into proper perspective. All of us needs to do that. Doesn't it, doesn't it kind of find us out a little bit? the circumstance we're going through. You know, where are we placing our faith? Is it, has it been in the regularity of life or has it been in Christ himself 
who is the center of life. So in some ways, the circumstances, you know, they're circumstantial. It's Christ who is Lord and is center. And maybe there's a bit of work to be done so that we recognize that. Um, I, I want to do one, a couple of things first. We're going to most certainly pray. And I, I want to make a couple of suggestions uh, before um, I pray. And that is, um, th- there's, are you planning already what the Christmas is like for you guys? Because uh, there's a bunch of these booklets have come. It's called The Peace and Promise of Christmas, 10, reflex- 10 Christmas Reflections from the Daily Bread. And um, myself and Colleen just started last, last night. And um, there's, they even have little videos and everything that go with them. So you can, there's a little video reference at the bottom. You can check it out if you're able to do that. But they're, they're simple thoughts and not a Bible passage to read. And then there's a, a short reading. So what are we planning to do that? And make sure that everybody in your home has got one. And it's a 10, 15 minute thing. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's, it's worth doing. So that's a, that's a real possibility. Uh, We want you to know that um, after supper every evening, myself and Colleen, the first thing we do after we, you know, put everything away is that we pray. We pray for you guys. We pray for this church. Uh, And so we, and that's every night. So listen, if you've got specific things that you'd like to, for us to pray for, why don't you send them off to me at my email, brianfcore at at hotmail.com. And you, you know you'll be prayed for or the, or the things that you're concerned for um, are getting prayed for. Do you know, what, the, one of the things I also listened to today was the, was the report from our, uh, you know, the Manitoba, uh, the government, the announcement today about, um, where there's a lot of restrictions, but there are other things we can do. Always look for the things that you can do. Do you know what you can do? You can go outside and a few people can actually walk. You have to do the usuals, keep the distance. But what about instead of just walking, that you pray as well? Maybe just saturate this town in prayer. So that's something you can do. What else can you do? Well, you just have to put those things down. What are the things we can do, not what are the things we can't do? It's not, a bit, it's not really about restrictions. So um, we're just going to go to prayer for a few things, and then I'm going to read a passage, and then Grant's uh, and Pham is going to come and lead us in worship. So let's bow together. What a wonderful way to start our morning, talking about joy. <clears throat> for a lot of people, we tend to think of joy as being someone else's experience, but being in Christ is a, a, it's, it's for our rejoicing. It's for our joy, according to 1 John, that the reality of our faith, him who was seen and heard and observed and touched, and that life that he brings and that life that he is came among us and they, they, it was witnessed. And John's prayer is that all of us would believe that at the very bottom of our hearts so that we would have fellowship with one another. Even though we may be physically apart, we can share an intimacy that only we in Christ can have by the Holy Spirit. And I pray that might be all of our experience, or if not, a reminder now that this is the reality of our lives. Always was in Christ. So the circumstances doesn't dissolve that reality. And help us just to claim it and help us to live out of it. We want to again just lift up before you the circumstances of Daryl and Cindy and Gordon and Anna Howard and Kathy at the work that you've called them to for the ministry concerns that they have. We pray that you would, as we pray every week, Lord, we will lift them up to you to, number one, that they get encouraged if they're not. And after getting encouraged, they may stay encouraged and may that be the work of each one of us, not just for these servants We thank you for Gordon and for Anna. Pray, Father, for his health to rapidly improve. And as he spends time back here, Lord, to visit and to even minister while he's here. We just submit these different ones to you, for for Howard and for Kathy, for the summer coming up. And all of the 
logistics of what that means. And we, but we pray that it's a time for all of these brothers and sisters to be maybe a, more of a time of resting and maybe not so much what you're doing through them as what you're doing in them. We lift up again Janet to you, Lord, for encouragement, for extra awareness of your power, extra awareness of your beauty, extra awareness of your presence, that no matter what happens in the next five minutes or five months, you are a God who has promised to be with us. So we submit her to you and we submit all the carers as well, Lord, to you. Lord, this is a great time for us as a church to worship and praise you, to lift up your name. And I just pray for the Weissner family as they come and do that, that we all would be found worshipers of the true and living God. So we, we ask these things, that, that you would prepare our hearts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on up. As we start uh, worshiping in music today um, and thinking about uh, this week's Advent, focused on joy, um, we'll be singing Joy to the World to start. And uh, I encourage you to look up kind of the, the history of, of the song because it actually was a poem. And it's based on Psalm 98. And it was um, Isaac Watts' interpretation of Psalm 98, looking at Christ returning um, in, in his glory. And, uh, and, and so it's a different perspective on, on what we sing as a traditional Christmas hymn. As the Israelites were waiting for Christ to come, Christ the Messiah to come, we too are waiting for him to come back. And... Uh, being people of Christ should fill us with such joy with the anticipation of him coming, but with the relationship we can have with him right now. Let us sing together.
you very much it's a blessing to have you guys thank you for blessing us with those songs wonderful eh? some of them new I didn't know one of them definitely I haven't heard before so it's great to hear new songs isn't it singing about the same things isn't it the one who's overcome the grave there's no point to this if he hasn't so it's just a great and wonderful reminder but of course it's about our worship of the one who is risen from the dead. I, I want to continue the series that we're doing on um, light in the darkness uh, and to highlight the different characters that they're in the story, of course, and some of them are more important than others. I mean, there's very few less important than Mary, the mother of Jesus. But I, I want for us to get a... Um, 
to learn, most certainly, yes. But I want us to see them as real people. Uh, but more than that, I, I want us to see them, not just the story of their lives, but the greatest story of God to bring them to have a story so that we ourselves can have our stories changed by theirs. So it's a real blessing for me to have a look at Mary, and I hope it's a blessing for you too. Uh, so you'll need your Bible with you. So we're going to look at, Ma uh, sorry, at Luke and chapter 1 and verse 46 to 55. Now I'm going to read that for us. It's called the Magnificat. It's a Latin word, isn't it? about the glory of God, the praise of his name. It's actually in the first line, my soul exalts. So the Latin comes from the exaltation of who the Lord is. So again, let's just buy, uh, and then we'll read his word, and then we'll ask the Spirit of God um, to, to teach us from his word. Heavenly Father, again, we just want to buy because we know we need to. We need to bow our hearts, Lord, to you, because we're distracted with all kinds of things. Maybe that we're already not interested. Maybe we're, we are, have a tendency to wander, tendency to not focus. So I pray for a new awakening for all of us this morning, that the Holy Spirit's here. You, des not, you desperately want, you just want to teach us we desperately need to hear it. And so I pray for each one of us, O oh God, just as we look at your word, that we'd come with fresh eyes again, because that's what your Holy Spirit wants to do. Make this fresh for us, to change our hearts in your presence. So we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So let me begin in verse 46, in chapter 1 of Luke. And Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord's, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and he has sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel his servant, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his descendants forever. This is God's word. When we look at the faith of an individual, the temptation is to focus on their subjective experience. We want to assess, you know, we want to assess, is this the real deal? Or is it sleight of hand? We ask all kinds of questions, make all kinds of observations as to the possible inconsistencies, maybe, obvious contradictions, maybe, or the oblivious discrepancies of a person's life. Now, it's tough, isn't it? Because we all see the bold brushstrokes of a person's life. But we know that life isn't lived in broad strokes. It's in the attention to deliberate details. Isn't that right? So when we look at Mary, the mother of Jesus, a number of things struck me in my scrutiny of Mary. The num number one... Who did I think I was to subject anyone to the kind of approach like this, especially for a person like Mary? In fact, I, I got brought around a shed, you know, for a spiritual humbling, because Mary's faith, while it's exceptional, it's deep, 
and it's attractively surprising. All of a sudden, I became extraordinarily thankful that my life hasn't been subject to such scrutiny. Mary's character lingers and captures us in such a way that you just can't look away for its beauty and you can't help be attracted, but be attracted and humbled. In that she seems to carry a heavy weight faith upon such a slight frame. You know, I was actually going to call this message Marvelous Mary. And when we're finished, I think that you think so too. You know, without the danger of elevating someone from a purely humanistic perspective. So, we need to look at a bit of the background, like I usually do, and I think it's important. So before we get to the contours of our faith, we've got to lay the biblical groundwork to this Fabergé of faith. Because you're not going to be able to get to the heart of this portrait of belief until you fill out this full of biblical narrative of just of how she came to be who she was and do what she did. Number one. You see, firstly, the story of Mary does not begin with the birth of a savior, but the full knowledge of God. That's important. A point we could all well remember. When our stories are not just visited by calm seas, but violent storm, storms, Mary's going to embrace a storm that none of us have ever had to face before. Maybe ever. It's good to remember because we end up, uh, we, before we end up with just a religious biography, that the theology of election consists in the sovereign grace of God choosing Mary in Christ before the foundation of the world, that she would be holy and blameless before him. A holiness and a blamelessness that was obviously beyond question. But election still has to be lived out in living color. No one is going to dispute that Mary's life, it's a kaleidoscope of color that will overwhelm the senses. You know, in God's loving purposes, we may express theological depth that God predestined Mary to adoption as a daughter through Jesus Christ to himself. And that was according to the kind intention of his will, says Ephesians 1, verse 4 and 5. You're thinking, that just sounds too theological. But here's the truth. I've said no, nothing different than you're going to see in the story. You see, true theology that Paul writes about is all doxology. What we believe will lead us to true worship. And all of this is wonderful, and it is wonderful. There's no, real, there's no contradiction, is there, between the gospel stories and the theological interpretation of those stories. But when you look at it all from the perspective of the end, because we know what happens, don't we? We know what happens with Mary. We know what happens with her life. We know what happens with her son. You might thank God that we don't know the details in advance. All of a sudden, you lose this image of this quiet country girl and replace it with a, a sanctified ancient Near East version of Captain Marvel. You know, without the costume or the self-importance. You see, she's godly and she's marvelous. See, the second thing is that the story of Mary is already embedded in the love and the kindness of God. Revealed at the beginning of the scriptures. So you go from eternity, the sovereign electing God, at the beginning of the, the revelation opening. At the very creation at that very time, it's subject to the fall of our first parents, isn't it? The Lord God says to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you more than all the cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you'll go, dust you'll eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, do you see this? Between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. 
He shall bruise you on the head. And you will bruise him on, on the heel. First preaching of the gospel, isn't it? Genesis 3, verse 14 and 15. You see, the human seed born of Mary continues through the godly lineage of Mary as her child would be bruised on the heel. How? Well, through the cross. But through that bruising, he'll crush the head of the serpent. And why will he do that? Well, he'll do that for you and for me. The third thing I want us to see is that the story of Mary doesn't begin in raw history, but as a sure outworking of the prophetic words of a gracious God. For when God offered King Ahaz, remember, a blank check to ask him, to ask him any sign whatsoever in Isaiah, Isaiah 7 and verse 10. And he says this, Make it as deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. How does this thug king respond? His words are snide, and they're and it's a sinister insult to the God he should bow to. I won't ask, he says. I won't test the Lord. Gladly, our response was not like the patient and powerful response of the Lord in the mouth of Isaiah. For he returns, listen now, you house of David. Is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men and you'll try the patience of God as well? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son and you'll call him, she'll call him Emmanuel. Well, now the story begins. We've come from eternity to the very beginning of the gospel. Fast forward as the curtains open in the gospel accounts when the head crusher of Satan is shown to be none other than Jesus, the Messiah, who is the son of David, the king, who's going to fulfill the Davidic covenant as king of kings, isn't that right? But also as the son of Abraham, who comes to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant promises that you find all the way through the scriptures to those who have faith in him. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. You see these two things. So the sweeping genealogy of the promised Messiah then parks itself in the live recording of a young girl who's betrothed to a fine specimen of godliness in the shape of Joseph, who's also a descendant of David. And the scripture says that before they came together, now I hope you understand what that means, before their marriage is consummated through sexual union, she was found to be with child. Now that's not normal, is it? That's a miracle, that's a fulfillment of prophecy, definitely. She was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit, says Matthew 118. And, and you know the account, you know the angel comes in and he says, Greetings, favoured one. Luke begins the angelic announcement with these words. Greetings. Greetings. Favoured one. Now, the way Luke described it, uh, we may not have concord with the heavenly visit, especially from what you now know of Mary's life and what's going to happen. It may not have concord with the heavenly visitor's concept of divine favor, but what will knock your socks off is that Mary does, she really does, you know. The Lord is with you, the angel will say. And if the angel had informed us of the unfolding of that divine plan of God, we might wish that he was with someone else. Most certainly we're glad we didn't get the visit. But she won't. She really means it. If it's God, it's good. That's her assumption. That's her presupposition. Is it ours? Now she's perplexed, says the account. And she ponders. Might you do the same thing? Perplexed? Perplexed. An angel visits how about sign me up for a lobotomy? You know, because I might be just losing it. Preferably between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m., please. 
That would be my natural response, I would think. But you know, the key is in verse in, chap, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 30. The angel says to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You have found favor with God. See, there it is, isn't it? In other words, she already has this tight relationship with the glorious covenant God. She has loved her a whole life. We wonder, why don't we have a kind of a bring it on faith? A bring it on attitude, just like Mary. Well, if you see the necessary detail, her faith was already prepped for obedience. So, a virgin birth. A virgin birth. What's all that about? Why was that necessary? Well, the two questions, one by Zacharias and the other by Mary, they're actually not in the same category. Do you remember the question from last week? She asks how, but it's not like Zacharias asking how. See, he wants the angel to give him a certainty he already should have had, but he didn't. Mary? No. She hasn't scuppered the obvious limited knowledge of the angel. Mary was, could probably say to the angel, let me pull you aside a little bit and I'll tell you how babies are made. She doesn't. Well, you could expect, she'll say, well, after the wedding night, that's what you probably would think normally. Well, no, because this slip of a thing is already so fine-tuned to the almighty God of the scriptures. That's why the sign given to Zacharias is silence. And the sign given to Mary was the pregnancy of her aging relative Elizabeth. So when she asks how, she knows that God can violate his own ordinances for his eternal purposes. You see, marriage is a creational institution of God, but it's not an eternal institution. Now we, we get it, don't we? This conception that's going to be governed by the Holy Spirit. We're just so used to hearing it, but it's incredible, isn't it? And the overshadowing superintendence of God most high, says Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. And for this reason, so if you're looking for all the reasons of how this happens technically, this is it. Conception will be governed by the Holy Spirit, overshadowed by God Most High. And for this reason, the Holy Child is the Son of God. See, she knows, but many will not. See, we understand it from afar that after the consummation that I've talked about, the window... For a virgin birth, well, it kind of goes out the window, doesn't it? See, what we understand is that her child is the fulfillment of 39 books of the Old Testament, says Matthew in chapter 1, verse 22. So how does Mary respond to it all? Well, as you can see, the story involving Mary doesn't revolve around Mary. See, how does she see herself? Well, here's her own words. She's a, she says, I'm a servant of God. I'm a willing, loving servant of God. In fact, the way it's phrased, behold, it sounds like a bit of grandstanding. Behold, behold, behold. Everyone, behold. You think you're cool? I'm on God's speed dial of favorites. No. Behold, because I rejoice in being God's slave. I'll serve him in any way that he commands me. His word is the only thing that matters to me. In other words, the way Luke says it, may it be done to me according to your word, which of course is the powerful word of God himself. Isn't that what she says? Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, may it be done to me according to your word. Isn't that wonderful? See, what we find in that encounter with Mary as she visits 
Elizabeth is that you see what a true believer looks like. In the 70 mile trip to this relative, or gracious relative, Elizabeth, two words stand out in the account that we talked about last week. One about Mary, the other about Elizabeth. The first was how Mary's greeting is actually mentioned three times. Three times in a couple of verses, from verse 39 to 45 in chapter 1. Mary enters the house. She greets Elizabeth. Mary's greeting is followed by two things. The baby leaps for joy, which is what started with this morning. The baby leaps for joy in the womb, according to Elizabeth. And she herself is filled with the Holy Spirit. And prophecy comes out of her mouth. The second word is blessed. What does she say to Mary? Among every woman on the planet, you are the most blessed. The baby you're carrying is the same. And as for me, I am so blessed that this most blessed of all women would bless me by coming to visit and grace my home. See, what ties this momentous exchange together is actually Mary's faith in God's word. Look what she says, and blessed is she who believed. Because you believed the message of God with that certainty of fulfillment, do you? Do we come to the word like this? So this, through this heavenly visitor, she says, you're truly blessed because of that. Are you getting what Luke is saying? The deepest, truest, most glorifying, most blessed response to God is actually Faith, it's trusting him. It's a delightful trust. Great story, isn't it? So after about three months, a three-month stay caring for this, for the aged but very pregnant Elizabeth, Mary herself returns home. And in about another six months, by the way, she's going to make that trip again. This time with Joseph, her wonderful husband, to be registered along with him. As Luke says, Luke says again, she was with child. We know, we get it. She's actually very, very with child at this stage. Isn't that right? And where do you end up? You end up watching Joseph and Mary staying in the animal section of a house, a trough for a bed, wrapped in cloths, lying in a manger, what is in effect a stable, where the animals chow down. And to beat all irreparable shepherds, glorious angels, come together in this stable and they meet in praise and worship of Jesus. What does Mary do? The word says she treasures these things. It's a wonderful word, isn't it? She doesn't treat them as ordinary. She treasures them, something that stays in the heart. And she ponders them. Maybe we need to do a lot more pondering on his word so that it does stay and become treasured in the heart. So now on to the Magnificat. We're just going to spend a couple of minutes. First thing that Mary does is she gets personal. See, the first two lines of Mary's worship song is the deep and they are profoundly beautiful. From all we know about Mary, they mean more than they appear. Look what she says. Are you listening? My soul exalts the Lord. That's where we get the word, the Magnificat, from. You see, my soul has to do it. Because my words and my abilities won't. My soul exalts it. These are the words of someone who is just so absolutely captured. Her heart is captured. You know what that's like, don't you? You see, we have entered a, a sacred space. It's an abandonment like no other expression of affection and wonder. She's lost in his sovereign majesty. My spirit, she says, has rejoiced in God, my Savior. 
You see, her worship has a center. You see, we're not worshiping if it doesn't. Her worship has a center, and it's not in the form of the worship, but in the interior joy she feels for her sovereign king. See, for Mary, worship is primary. For her, it's nothing but a heart crying out in praise because that's the reality of the heart. So her worship of God reveals really what God wants us as his children to delight ourselves in. Mary is like chief of the gobsmacked when she says, who am I? I'm nobody in the eyes of the world. But my Lord singles me out to be useful to him. I, I'm just an hour of his name. How could I not be? I have actually, she says, I've been exalted by him, by God, my Lord, my creator, my redeemer, my savior. I've been exalted by him. And this God, he has done great things for me, like for me. And who am I? Small, limited, imperfect, and him, holy. Isn't that what just says? Right there in his word, holy is his name. This I know, that all the nations shall be blessed through the child that's in my womb. How am I supposed to feel? What am I supposed to believe? What do you want me to say? There are no words. She gets personal, doesn't she? It's, it's, the, it's the revelation of an internal world. My soul exalts the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. He has regard for my humble state. All the generations will call me blessed. The mighty one has done great things for me. See, the faith of Mary reveals that she knows him. She, isn't that obvious? She knows this God. He favors her. She is his servant. She submits to his will for her, for her life. She's blessed because she believes his word is absolutely sound. And this causes this humble servant to worship in a way that's simply stunning. You know what's in this song? The knowledge of the word of God that she has. She quotes 12 different references. She reveals her trust in those 12 references, trust in his power, trust in his sovereign rule, and the certainty that his will would be done. She fully believes that the covenant God of her forefathers, all his promises will be fulfilled. There's something else in this magnificent. And so Mary now gets real. For some, she'll say this, and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him, who reverence his name, like Mary does. Look in verse 52, the second part. And has exalted those who were humble. Isn't that wonderful? Look at verse 53, the first part. He has filled the hungry with good things. And verse 54 and 55, he's given help to Israel, his servant, Remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, descendants, forever. See those main things? That's a promise for those with Mary-like faith. It's mercy, isn't it? Exaltation and it's blessing. It's a great deal. By faith, this is what he does in the heart. Well, for others, it's different, isn't it? Look in verse 51. He's done mighty deeds with his arms. He's scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. That's some warning, isn't it? Look in verse 52 now, the first part of that verse. He's brought down rulers on their thrones. And if you do that, the rulers and thrones, what about us? Look what he's saying in verse 53. He sends away the rich with nothing. Is any one of us doubting that we're not the rich today? 
We have to make sure that the Lordship of Christ covers every part of our lives. That's real faith, isn't it? And that's Mary getting real. You know, she'll say for those outside of Christ who have all those characteristics, she'll say there's judgment. Man, she's telling it like it is. It isn't just all about mercy and exaltation and blessing. It's judgment, humiliation, and affliction. And after she finishes her psalm of worship, she gets off her, of her knees and she serves Elizabeth for three months, putting herself at the service of this aged, pregnant wife of a mute priest. Would you believe that she's about 16 years of age? 16. I'm nearly 60 and I feel absolutely humbled. Now, I would love to leave it there, but you can't. Because there's a sting in the tail, isn't it? See, all, listen to what Mary has gotten so far. What she's going to go through, what her son will go through. There's no cross mentioned yet, you see. Simon comes on the scene, doesn't he? In chapter 2. There's a man, verse 25, it says in chapter 2, in Jerusalem, his name is Simeon. He's righteous, he's devout, he's looking for this consolation of Israel. The Holy Spirit's upon him. It's actually been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't see death until he sees the Lord's Christ. But look what then happens in verse 34 and 35. Simon blessed Mary and Joseph. They're up in Jerusalem presenting Jesus for circumcision. Mary blesses him, but look what he does next. He singles, he puts, brings Mary aside, and he says to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed. She can get with that because she's just been saying all that. But he'll be appointed for the fall and the rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. A sign to be opposed? See, just in case you were thinking it's all about happy thoughts and positive vibes. What's this fall about? For the fall and rise? He's going to be opposed? That doesn't make any sense. He has come to save people. How can he be opposed? Mary, much more pondering is required, isn't it? But just in case you may have misunderstood, Simon finishes with a bolt of lightning that surely stuns Mary in her tracks. A sword's going to even pierce your own soul, she says. Verse 35. Who'd want to be this mother? Mary will watch her sinless son be crucified. Another personality arises, Anna. She's a prophetess, and at the very moment she came up when she began giving thanks to God, just like Simeon, continued to speak of him to all those who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. See, both of these aged saints, they give thanks to God for the child. The one's going to emphasize the cost. The other's going to emphasize the result. Do you know what the result is? Your salvation and mine. Now, at the very end... Jesus remembers her. Remember John chapter 19, verse 25. Standing by the cross, this young girl, who is now 33 years on, standing by the cross of Jesus is his mother, mom, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene. At the end, Jesus remembers her. It's an interesting verse. Listen carefully. When Jesus then saw his mother and a disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And he said to a disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own household. See, then... When the work of the cross, which is his reason for coming, for you and for me, then he sees this wonderful woman. Then he sees her, because his work is done, isn't it? He's going to die there. Then he sees her. 
And with his dying breath, he'll care for her to the end. As she did for him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we've been given the blessing of looking at the faith of a great servant, we are humbled by it because we know that there are areas in our own life that we wouldn't call faith. Struggle, maybe. We're so thankful for this story of Mary and all that she's gone through. The wonder, the beauty that she calls being blessed and the hardship that goes with it. We know that's the, there are two realities of our lives as well. But do we have faith? Are we trusting you? Are we taking up all of these characteristics that were so evident in Mary's life so that our faith would be like hers? We're asking for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. The voices are going to close us in song. God has spoken My Everything changes Everything changes Angels come with words of wonder My Freedom from the curse we're under Everything changes, everything changes, oh, 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 glory, glory in the highest God, we praise you, Savior, Savior to the lost and broken, Jesus, Jesus our Redeemer here. My heart sings, heart sings hallelujah. Here today, love's incarnation. My heart sings hallelujah. He's come to seek and bring salvation. My heart sings hallelujah. Everything changes. Everything changes. Oh, 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 glory, glory in the highest God. We praise you, Savior, Savior to the lost and broken. Jesus, Jesus, our Redeemer, here to save us, my heart sings. Hearts in hallelujah. Come a little closer, sing a little louder, join with all the angels, worship him. Come a little closer, sing a little louder, join with all the angels, worship him. Come a little closer, sing a little Join with all the angels, worship Him. Come a little closer, sing a little louder. Join with all the angels, worship Him. Glory, glory in the highest God. We praise You, Savior, Savior to the lost and broken. Jesus, our Redeemer, here to save us. My heart sings, heart sings hallelujah. Come a little closer, sing a little louder. Join with all the angels, worship Him. Come a little closer.
Sing the little louder. Join with all the angels. Worship Him. My heart sings. Heart sings hallelujah. My heart sings. Heart sings hallelujah. Mary would sing that, wouldn't she? Her heart sings hallelujah. I hope that's what you're doing this morning, that you're singing hallelujah, praise God. That's a powerful testimony, Mary, wasn't it? It's actually power manifested in weakness. Isn't that what you get from our life? It's quite wonderful. You might be thinking this morning, you know, yeah, thanks for pointing out that she got singled out for doing all this, but what about me? Do I get singled out for stuff? God's purpose for you is no different than Mary. This was the role that she had, God had for her, but he's got a purpose for you. You know, it's being found faithful to the one who is faithful to us. Let's buy. Now, the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good work to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, love one another.